So memory improvement is not just a game. We've had some really amazing response for this introductory webinar, as this is a, a really hot topic, a hot button issue that people are concerned about. And we'll see in just a couple of moments some numbers behind what we're looking at as far as folks uh, getting on in age, as well as some issues related to aging that are so important to talk about at, at this particular point in time. So there's so much great information that I'd love to share with you and uh, really to help get you on the right path to boosting your memory. There, I could go on for hours and hours and hours as many of my students uh, that have taken my classes over the years would, would uh, agree with. So having your wits about you and elevating the quality of your life and your later years is really so important. You know, we're living longer and longer. Our senior population is skyrocketing, as you'll see shortly. So go ahead and stick with me. And, and we do have a lot to cover. Uh, those that have taken courses with me before know that I do tend to cover things pretty quickly because there is so much ground to cover. But the luxury you have here is to be able to go back and, and watch it again and again and again. So I do promise that you will learn something valuable in this short time together. I do promise that. And at the end of this webinar, webinar, I have a fantastic offer for those of you who are looking for more information on how to build a better brain. So before we get started and get into the heart of this training, I just want to take a few minutes to let you know my background and why I got into the brain sciences. I think it's important for people to understand that, uh, you know, whoever they're working with or learning from should really have a, a passion for what they do and a thorough understanding of what they do. So, you know, my my love for brain, uh, the brain and brain health uh, really started when I was, you know, when I was tiny before I even knew it was having such an impression on me. Uh, to set the stage, I was the kind of kid who uh, sat behind the TV trying to figure out where the picture came from while others sat in front, you know, watching the actual the actual picture. So, you know, I, I kind of had an engineer's mind and a, uh, and a, and a heart for the sciences. So I think that's really important that I was kind of just observing and trying to figure things out as I was growing up and then naturally wound up on the path that I did um, at this point in time. So uh, with that, I, I really developed a fascination for the brain and its powerful yet extremely fragile nature. And this developed early on observing those around me, particularly my grandparents. Uh, my grandfather is someone I always talk about, uh, pop up as we used to call him. He was a, a true Renaissance man. He was a, uh, you know, what we call now a lifelong learner. And, you know, we're talking, you know, 30, uh, even 40 years ago, uh, looking at an individual like this. And that term didn't really exist, this lifelong learner term that we hear so much these days. But he was a, a veterinarian and he used to teach uh, adjunct as an adjunct faculty uh, professor at Cornell University and develop surgical procedures. But aside from all of that, he really had a passion for developing his horizons, if you will. He had an approach to life where he would learn new things all the time. So every two or three or even four years, he would learn a new skill that he could carry with him for the rest of his life whether it was being a car mechanic, a singer, a uh, musician. Uh, there was just so many things, an avid reader, a photographer, a cook, uh, just on and on and on. I remember he used to bottle these sodas all the time back in the day. Um, and, uh, you know, he just had a passion for learning how to do these things and collecting the right equipment and making the perfect soda. So anyhow, uh, this is what he did as a natural approach to life. And he passed away at 93 years old, but he was sharp as a tack when he passed. And it was unfortunate, uh, it was an accident that led him into the hospital and, and some complications in the hospital that led to his death. But he could have lived easily another you know, 10, 15, 20 years the way he was going. He would get up every morning and do his push-ups and his jumping jacks and his reading and everything else that he did throughout the course of his day. So you know, over time, that really stuck with me. And, and that's how I approach things with people these days and how I teach because it's all about neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change and grow over time. And that's exactly what I saw with him constantly. Now, the, the quick flip side of that is when he passed away, my grandmother, who was just as cognitive, cognitively, uh, but not so physically active, uh, once he passed, she lost a tremendous amount of interest in life. And within a year after his passing, she passed away. Uh, she had no health issues, but her activity levels went way down and her, uh, her zest for life and learning went way down. So as we'll see today, some of these factors that uh, influenced her life and, and weren't being utilized caused her brain to essentially uh, shut down along with her body. So, you know, we had two sides of the coin there and really uh, helps us understand how the brain works and, and really what is kind of, uh, you know, uh, outright or not led to my, my passion and thirst for knowledge when it comes to the brain. And I, I hope to be able to pass that on to you as we go along. So now back to the task at hand. 
the amount of information we could cover here is really endless, and the brain sciences change daily. I, I tell people all of the time, anything over five years in the brain sciences is really considered a, a dinosaur in terms of the you know paper or reference book or something like that. So things do change rapidly. That's why we need to continue to learn. And I'm 20 years into this and really uh, feel like I'm just getting started. So it's a uh, it, it's great to have this kind of novelty and newer understanding all the time. But uh, we're going to pass on to you our current understanding of things and. And uh, today I've picked just a few key points for you to think about that are most pertinent to uh, adults like yourselves looking to improve the quality of your brain health and your life. This is what it's all about. This is why people take the classes I teach and now the webinars that I teach. And there's going to be three topics we're talking on today. And we'll explain what they mean in just a moment. But we have the canary in the coal mine, you are what you eat, and brain training is not a game. So let's go ahead and get started here. So I'm going to go ahead and advance the slide. And um, as you see right here, we're talking about memory improvement is not a game. So I'm going to, excuse me, just back up one second. And um, we're going to talk about essentially memory loss. I call them secrets simply because many people are not aware of these things that we think about as being seemingly simple in day-to-day -day clinical practice. Um, you know, we call them memory loss secrets because not many people are aware of them. So memory loss secrets you wish you knew years ago. And it's really never too late to build a better brain. But my focus, the further on I get into practice, and I'm going on 17 plus years at this point, uh, is to really help people on the front end of things before things break down, before it's too late, because I've seen too much of it's too late. And it's really uh, disheartening and, and really, uh, really troubling when we can't help people after a certain point because of, of, of the amount of damage or decline and uh, neglect that they've had in their lives. So we're going to go ahead and move forward here and just get right into it. So memory improvement is not just the game. We talked about the three areas of the canary in the coal mine. You are what you eat. And brain training is not a game. So We'll start here with just a little bit of a uh, reference point. Uh, I like numbers. Uh, numbers can be skewed in the sciences really any way uh, the the individual that is working with those numbers they can be skewed really any way any way you like it really depends on what's being looked at and you know what the need is for the the data but this is from the uh, from the US Census Bureau uh, the Alzheimer's Association I've gone to all of these various entities and uh, and, and just really tried to put things together to make sense of what's happening because there's a tremendous critical mass um, that's approaching over the next you know, 20, 30 years and it's, it's starting right now where we have so many people that are aging into a segment of the population where they need to be really concerned about the health of their brain. So point of reference right now, the US population over the age of 65 right now in the United States is approximately 50 million people. Uh, just about three years ago, it was about 40 million. So you can see how rapidly these numbers are gaining. It's estimated by 2050 or so that it will be almost double at 90 million. So there are a lot of people heading into this over 65 category with significant burdens on their physical and mental health, their families and caregivers, their communities, and the healthcare system as a whole. So we really need to preserve the integrity of our families, our communities, the healthcare system, et cetera. We need to understand these things so we can really leave, uh, lead the healthiest life possible and uh, be able to function well into our later years. You know, it's all about quality versus quantity, in my opinion. Most of us can live longer through the advances in modern medicine. But we want to be healthy and and uh, and cognitively able in those later years. So this is why we're here to talk about what we're talking about. So top line, 50 million people over the age of 65. The second line, mild cognitive impairment. So approximately 20% of those over 65 are believed to have mild cognitive impairment. Now I can tell you, based on my practice and the students I work with and the the patients I serve, I can tell you that number is probably quite a bit higher, maybe 25, 30% or even more. But if we just look at it as 20%, as we're talking about 10 million people in the United States that have mild cognitive impairment or mild cognitive decline. Now, what is that? That's the walking into the room, forgetting what you went in for, uh, possibly some language issues, you know, remembering certain words, that type of thing. But it doesn't necessarily interfere too much with your daily life. You just know something is, is not right and the people around you see the mind slipping a little bit. 
Now, Alzheimer's, we know at this point over the age of 65, <clears throat> uh, or at the age of 65, is one in nine people have Alzheimer's disease. Um, so now we're looking at 5.5 million here, and you know that's roughly the size of uh, the population in the state of Colorado, for example. So an entire state of people having Alzheimer's, could you imagine that? That's what we have in this country. Mild cognitive impairment. We have, you know, we have more people than live in New York City with mild cognitive impairment. So these are really staggering statistics, and they're only going to continue to grow exponentially as time goes on. So we're going to move forward. The canary in the coal mine. What is the canary in the coal mine? Basically, this is clues, right? The canary in the coal mine tells you when things are going wrong, so hopefully you can make some changes before disaster strikes. So clues. We have clues that we call biomarkers. Now, most people have probably heard the term biomarker at one point or another, and really this is just simply a marker of life. Bio meaning life, it's a marker of life. So we have things that can be measured accurately in the brain and in the body that can tell us about many, many aspects of brain health. So with that, we understand too that, excuse me one second, this slide is not advancing. Okay. So in the past, biomarkers were considered blood markers. So you have blood sugar and cholesterol and all those types of things. Now we understand that biomarkers spread to everything um, in addition to blood markers. So these can go on and on and on. Some examples would be, particularly for the aging population, people concerned about memory and cognitive function, would be things like smell, balance, eye movements, blood sugar, cognitive function, and so much more, also to the uh, the various laboratory analysis. Even now, genetic testing is playing into the biomarker realm, and we can learn a lot about people through these biomarkers, and we can tell really how well their brains are working relatively easily. So these tools and, and uh, assessment options are at our fingertips, and they're just being incredibly underutilized. And if they are being utilized, there's oftentimes nothing being done to deal with the uh, the outcomes of these types of tests. So if somebody has a challenge with their smell that's identified on a test, and, and smell was one of the original canaries in the coal mine when it came to memory decline, uh, because we can see that well before somebody's memory starts to slip to the point of dementia. But what happens when we measure that? What can we do about it? There's a lot we can do. There's aromatherapies and other types of things that can be done. So we can measure smell and do something about it. We can measure balance and do something about it. We can measure eye movements and do something about it, and so on. Given our limited time here in this particular uh, presentation today, what I'm going to do is just simply focus on one of these biomarkers. And even just focusing on balance, I've done classes that I've, I've spoken about balance simply for uh, about two hours, and we're just scratching the surface there. So I'm going to try to do my best in about 10 minutes or so to, uh, to, to cover this topic of balance and how it relates to your higher brain functions. So balance and memory. I put in the parentheses the word cognition. So here, for our purposes, memory and cognition are interchangeable. So basically, memory is an aspect of cognition. So when I say cognition, I'm also meaning memory. It's just important to know because you will hear those terms used, and you might think they're completely separate entities. But for our purposes today, they are one and the same. So balance and memory. Balance is one of the most reliable markers of cognitive function. And I say this to people all the time. This is something we look at, something we treat, and something we see that has a massive impact on people's ability to think and remember. But still, most people are, uh, I guess, in the dark, if you will, in terms of this understanding of how the two are related. But almost every person we ask, when we, uh, when we get to talking with them and they tell us about memory challenges and you know trouble with thinking and reasoning and interacting with people, uh, we also ask them about balance. And most of the individuals will say they've had a change in their ability to maintain balance or they've had a change in their coordination or the way they walk. Uh, walking is really just an extension of your balance. So all of these things can and are most likely impaired when people are dealing with memory or cognition struggles. So it is also which is a really, really good thing. It's also one of the most treatable 
markers of cognitive function. Uh, most people have heard of vestibular rehabilitation or balance therapy or gait training. These are all ways that our inner ear system that helps us to maintain good balance on two legs um, that we can rehabilitate these systems. Now the key is identifying what's wrong with these systems. Is it more the inner ear mechanisms? Is it the eyes plugging into the balance system? Is it our postural muscles plugging into the balance system? <clears throat> you think about it, most people that have challenges with balance, just like the fella in the picture here on the walker, um, most people have struggles with posture as well. So when posture declines, balance declines. When balance declines, cognitive function declines. So these things are all, uh, they all go hand in hand and we need to look at them all and see what would be the most beneficial from a treatment perspective. So I put this in here just to show you that what I'm telling you is supported very, very heavily in the literature. This is just one example of a paper that came out just earlier this year, just a few months ago. It was called, the name of the paper was The Association Between Vestibular and Cognitive Function in U.S. Adults. And this was out of the Journals of Gerontology, uh, which is basically the journals for aging population. And what they came up with was they said cognitive impairment that results from balance loss may contribute to difficulty with activities of daily life, that's ADLs, and also falls in older individuals. So let me break this down for you. People have cognitive impairment as a result of balance loss, and that leads to falls. So it's a vicious cycle. People are developing impairment, they can't think well because of their balance loss, and then they're falling on top of it, risking head injury and brain injury, which simply complicates the problem. And we see this day in and day out where people have hit their heads multiple times because their balance is so bad. So it's a vicious cycle that needs to be interrupted and needs to be changed if people are to live uh, healthy and, and um, with full cognitive function well into their later years. So i tell you a quick story about a fellow Roger that we had seen. He came from about uh, probably about 40 miles south of here and uh, in retirement, about 70 years old in retirement, he was a, still a very avid golfer. Uh, he was still working quite a bit in his retirement, managing rental properties and day trading in the stock market, that kind of thing. So really incredibly active. He didn't retire and just go to the beach. He went in for a surgical procedure in his inner ear and they actually had uh, injury to his eighth cranial nerve. Now your eighth cranial nerve has to do with balance. So there was injury to the nerve. It wasn't completely severed, but it was damaged to the point that his balance suffered uh, significantly after the incident. So in about six weeks after the incident, his balance had gotten so bad that his wife started to notice decline in his cognitive functions. Now, what was that? She always used to say he was the life of the party. Uh, he would be the, the one talking to everybody and, you know, and just talking up his golf game and, you know, making up the, 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 the kind of stories that guys make up at parties about fish or golf scores or whatever, whatever they talk about. So now he would go to parties and he would simply stare at the wall and, and just really have no interaction with people uh, because he, you know, he wasn't walking well and he was also declining cognitively. So his, his rate of cognitive decline was directly related to his rate of uh, balance decline and it showed we got him on different types of testing cognitive testing and balance testing and we saw that these things went hand in hand his balance functions and cognitive functions were so poor in six weeks that we weren't sure if we were going to be able to see improvements long story short we had a 10-day program with them where we're seeing him multiple times per day and we had about 25 30 percent improvement in his balance which led to approximately 45 percent improvement in various aspects of cognitive function including memory so we improved his balance the cognitive function and memory got better so these things go hand in hand this is what we see every day in practice this is a bit of an extreme case simply because most people had essentially uh, written it off and said you're just not going to get any better because that nerve was damaged but the fact is uh, we knew once we started with them that there was going to be some continued improvement so these things can get better in most cases now these things are fairly easy to assess with the right tools. There's things called uh, dynamic posturography and, and video nystagmography, all these big names, but it's really just measurements of balance, measurements of eye movements, measurements of other physical functions, and then you can determine what you need to do to get these folks back on track. Now, these are highly treatable in most cases, as we noted, and this is again through uh, vestibular or balance therapies, eye therapies, and so on. But there is, now we're talking about things that can be done in office. The purpose of this uh, type of program and, and modules that we'll discuss really are about you doing things to propel yourself forward, you doing things that will have a positive impact on your brain and your body, uh, 
without, in, in most cases, the need for uh, significant intervention on the other end, as long as it's done in time, as long as you don't have any other uh, you know, pre-existing conditions or issues that uh, might make it that you do have to seek some type of in-office treatment. And we'll talk about that as time goes on. But there is much you can do on your own, walking in the trails. Um, we t I talk about this specifically because you're walking on uneven surfaces that are often safe enough for individuals that have balance impairment um, to be to, to try to boost these systems a little bit and I always say you know I always have to throw in the disclaimer that if you are impaired to a certain degree that you are risking falling if you use a walker or a cane or something like that or if you have to hold on to things when you're walking I would not go out on the trail and start walking you have to do things to the best of your ability and there are ways to boost up function we don't have time to go through all kinds of rehabilitation protocols here but suffice it to say there are things that can bring you up the curve like yoga Tai Chi, pool exercises, and so on. So that's balance in a nutshell. Balance is directly related to cognitive function and needs to be addressed anytime somebody has struggles with their memory. And often we can see the declines in balance before memory issues develop. So we move on here. You are what you eat. This is a super important aspect of brain function that often goes neglected. You know, most people just eat for the love of eating or for the sake of eating or because they're hungry, but oftentimes don't put much thought into what it is they are in fact eating. So we're going to talk about this briefly and, and focus on one particular area today based on the time, uh, but probably the most important area as far as I'm concerned. So in a nutshell, food is the fuel that powers our cells and the chemical messengers that tell them what to do. This is really important because everything you eat breaks down into a fuel source and breaks down into chemical message messengers that tell your cells what to do. Now, when I say fuel that powers your cells, think sugar. All of your food at some point or another uh, generally breaks down into sugar that powers your cells. Glucose is the word, and we'll talk about that in a moment chemical messengers. What you need to think about here are hormones and neurotransmitters. So you have um, all of your various thyroid hormones and estrogen and testosterone. These are all made with amino acids and, and protein breakdown products. And these things signal your cells and, and, and your body and brain and tell it what to do for better or for worse. So if you don't get the right chemical messengers in through your food, your body will have to make do with what it has and often the results are not great. Um, neurotransmitters, that's obviously more what we're talking about. So if you want to have adequate dopamine, which is you know the feel-good neurotransmitter, or serotonin, uh, you know, which uh, you know, has been linked to OCD and other conditions, you, know, you need to make sure you have the appropriate food coming in. Acetylcholine is a big one for people People with memory problems because Aricept, uh, the, you know, the memory drug, so to speak, is all about preventing the breakdown of acetylcholine so it stays around longer so you can learn better. But if you're getting adequate uh, substrate or, or amino acids through your foods, you might not necessarily need a medication like that. Uh, we just don't know enough about it to really make those types of decisions yet. So one of the greatest factors related to brain health, in some cases probably the greatest, it really depends on the individual, but nutrition and other things we're going to talk about are such uh, major issues these days. So unfortunately for most, one of the most neglected and overlooked areas of brain health uh, is the diet. So let's talk about sugar. Sugar is, and this is another one where I could do, you know, I could do probably 12, 18 hours of courses just on, on blood sugar in your brain, but we're going to try to kind of put it in a nutshell and just have you understand the importance of why sugar is such a big deal when it comes to your brain health. So sugar is the primary source of fuel for your brain in most cases. Now, there are a lot of people that are, are doing away with sugar completely, and they're relying on different sources, what we call ketones. But I'm not going to talk about that right now because it's a small segment of the population, and there are some potential health issues associated with that. We will get that into that in, in, in later courses because it is such a popular topic. But for now, we need to understand the primary source of fuel for our brains is glucose, <clears throat> hence the little fuel gauge right there. We need to make sure we have fuel on board because your brain cannot store fuel. It needs a constant supply. 
This is something that a lot of people are unaware of. Your muscles can store fuel. Your brain cannot. So if you don't have a steady source of fuel coming in from the foods that you eat, your brain will suffer. And we'll see that's really important because your brain uses an awful lot of fuel. So what happens is what do people do? They skip breakfast because either they don't like to eat in the morning, they're trying to lose weight, um, they're too busy. And then they're going all of that time after they already fasted going through the night without sugar in the body, how do you think the brain is going to respond? How do you think kids are going to do on tests when they're going to school and they have no sugar in their body? Really important. So moving to this right here, your brain uses about 60% of the sugar that you take in under normal conditions. That makes the brain a very, very greedy organ and that's you know that's what it's been called because it uses so much. So if it's not available, it will suffer guaranteed and, and we see that with people when their blood sugar gets low they simply don't think very well this is why there is so much fatigue with cognitive decline most people you know that have cognitive impairment or dementia or alzheimer's which is just one type of dementia they're often not the most energetic individuals because their brains are so inefficient in their processing and so <clears throat> um, in, in certain cases broken down or degenerated that they use even more fuel to do very simple tasks like walking or reading. Um, you know, somebody could just read a map or a paragraph in a book and next thing you know, they're ready to take a nap. That's because their fuel is not being used appropriately. So this is really important to understand. So Mary, I'll talk about Mary briefly just to get you to understand, and this is a really extreme case. Uh, we had a woman come to us a couple of years ago. Uh, family had brought her in, her caregiver, her husband had brought her in. She was full-blown Alzheimer's. Uh, she was wandering from the home, late-stage Alzheimer's, uh, having other serious physical problems as a result. But most, I won't say most, many have heard now that Alzheimer's is being called type 3 diabetes. If you go on Google and you type in type 3 diabetes, um, it's been well accepted that Alzheimer's is almost like a form of diabetes in the brain as well as our other types of dementia. So when we have somebody like Mary, we almost always assume that they have a problem with blood sugar handling. So first thing I asked was, does she have diabetes? And sure enough, she had type two insulin dependent diabetes. That means she had an insulin pump on her side, pumping insulin to, into her body all the time uh, because her insulin did not work anymore. She would spike blood sugar levels of 500 sometimes. And most people are aware that you wanna keep your blood sugar under 100. So she was almost five times normal limits sometimes, uh, usually about three to 500. That's why she would wander from the home because her brain just would not work anymore. She couldn't remember anything, didn't know where she was. She would get scared, fearful, and she would just try to run away. So we basically counseled the family and said, I just don't, you know, we don't think there's anything we can do at this point. And we very rarely say that type of thing in clinical practice because we always feel there's a higher level of function for people to get to. This particular individual, her husband said, do whatever you can. I don't care what it is. Um, so we had gotten her more on uh, nutritional recommendations, what we call medical foods. We basically took her off her, her, her normal routine diet, which was very high in sugar, very high in fried fats and, and sodium and things like that. Uh, just generally not a good brain health diet. So we got her on a, 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 a high protein, high fiber, low sugar medical food diet for a period of about six weeks. And her blood sugar levels came to about 200 and they stayed there for a while. With that, she stopped wandering from the home. And the reason I say this is just to illustrate when the blood sugar was somewhat under control, she did not wander from the home. Her brain was working better. She did not have the fear and desire to run away. Now, unfortunately, her brain continued to decline. The family said enough was enough and they did uh, put her into a retirement facility and that was the end of the story. And last I know, um, she uh, she did uh, pass away. So this is, this is unfortunate and her, again, her condition was far advanced, but just shows you getting that blood sugar under control, even in late stages, will have an impact on the brain. So why not start ahead of time, get things correct so that we don't get to that point. So a couple of takeaways here. We want to, and this is something we will get into much greater detail if you if you uh, you know stick with us and listen to some of our classes in the future. But you need to eliminate refined and processed sugars. You know most people are aware of these things: high fructose corn syrup, and even many aspects of honey and and beet sugars and things like that are <clears throat> are highly refined and processed. Now they will spike our blood sugar very rapidly. They will damage our insulin responses, and they very easily theoretically can lead to. Uh, 
cognitive decline and dementia. So we want to limit added sugar intake to no more than 25 grams per day. So we'll tell you in a minute what that what that kind of equates to. But when you look at a food label, there's so many things on there, but those listed simply as sugars are added sugars. You have carbohydrates and fiber and all those others, but when it says sugar, that's added sugar. You should have no more than 25 grams of added sugar per diet in uh, per day in your diet. Now look at this. For your information, the average 12 ounce 12 ounce can of soda has about 40 grams of sugar. So you've almost doubled your added sugar intake with just one soda. And that doesn't mean you start going to the diet sodas and things like that. This is just an awareness issue that sugar is everywhere and we need to look out for it. And we can uh, avoid it and get around it and, and make better choices that our brain will simply thank us for. So moving forward, we're on the last uh, the last little bit right here, brain training is not a game. So uh, the, the, the title of this webinar, and I say this kind of tongue in cheek, <clears throat> we use brain games in clinical practice. Brain games are good, but are they always good? One question we get asked all the time, do brain games like Lumosity help? There's Brain HQ and Lumosity and all these other games, and I think most of them are fantastic. The short answer is yes, they help. The long answer, is there is so much more to the equation and that's where folks like myself come in because we really want to get under the hood or you know get under the surface and not just scratch the surface and try to make things um, work without investigating the other issues so if somebody's having trouble handling blood sugar and they're wandering from the home because they're spiking blood sugar levels of four or five hundred a brain game is not going to help that person no matter what brain game it is, no matter how good it is, it's not going to help that person because they can't do it. Their brain just simply doesn't work to that level, no matter how easy it is. So we have to look at blood sugar. We have to look at sleep hygiene. Are people sleeping? You know, sleep is one of the biggest detriments to our brain health at this point in time because people are not sleeping well. Dietary habits, so blood sugar, adequate protein intake, adequate fat intake. Fat is another big issue that we talk about in our in our webinars and our in-person classes. Uh, most people are not getting enough good fat in their diet. Exercise levels, you know, if we're not exercising, we are not actively engaging chemicals in our brain that will help our nerve cells connect and uh, help us learn more efficiently. And traumatic and medical history. If somebody's had some hits to the head, it will impact their ability to remember things and to think and to reason. But those things can be rehabilitated in most cases as well. Another uh, part of the equation, stress management, a big issue in our society today. I write in parentheses or lack thereof because we find most people are simply not managing their stress. So stress hormones unattended can do significant damage to the brain, particularly the parts of the brain that have to do with learning and memory. Medications is another, a vast topic, but something we need to take into consideration. There are many medications now linked very strongly, um, almost proven to be uh, part of the equation when it comes to dementia uh, or cognitive decline. Statin drugs, one example, are cholesterol-lowering medications. Also, too, there was just some recent uh, literature out there on antacids, certain classes of antacids contributing to dementia. So we need to look at these things. We need to understand and we need to potentially find options. Motivation levels and so much more. So the equation is large. The more we do to push our brain health in the right direction, the more certain brain training techniques like uh, balance therapies like games on your smartphone, uh, like uh, crossword puzzles and reading. The more these things will become effective if we address all of these other avenues effectively. So the more we address, the better our brain will be. You can't just address one avenue and expect that you're going to have these massive rapid turnarounds. And most people that ask me that question, do bring in games like Lumosity help? They usually say after that, I'm not sure if it's doing anything for me or not. So if they're not sure, then it's likely not having a big impact because of other reasons. So there are some valuable takeaways to improve your memory, and we're going to discuss those right now. And this is a just a small little section, kind of little takeaway, something you can do to, actually two things you can do to implement right away that will help you boost your memory. And the first one is a really cool research-based uh, exercise that um, has a profound impact on your ability to remember things, particularly what we call episodic memory. So, you know, do you remember what you did, you know, last week at a certain time or that restaurant you went to, things like that. So episodic memory is just one aspect of memory. And there's been a, uh, a bunch of research in this arena, but this particular paper 
was called the effects of psychotic bilateral eye movements on memory basically i you know i, I always tell people uh, these researchers like to write these big long titles to their papers for some reason when we could probably say it in you know three or four words but essentially the nutshell of this paper was performing a sequence of fast horizontal eye movements has been shown to facilitate performance on a range of cognitive tasks including the retrieval of the episodic memories. What does that mean? Moving your eyes back and forth real fast stimulates the front part of your brain and allows you to access memories more effectively. That's pretty cool. So when people are having trouble remembering things or even as a regular exercise, what I do here is, and you can come back and listen to this to see how um, see how we're kind of laying this out. But what you want to do is you want to do this in a seated position. You don't want to start moving your eyes fast when you're standing or walking because you could throw your balance off. And I will put in a, a bit of a disclaimer or caveat at this point. If you have balance issues uh, or any type of challenge with your vestibular function or even cognitive function to a certain degree, I would avoid this exercise until you have appropriate evaluation. But what it is, you're sitting in a chair and on the wall, just about arm's length in front of you at eye level, you just can have a piece of paper with two little dots about 12 inches apart, 10 to 12 inches apart, and they would be horizontally in the same plane. So it would be parallel with the floor. So you'd have two dots um, in front of your eyes, arm's length on the wall, and you simply move your eyes back and forth, left to right, left to right, left to right, back and forth between those dots for about 30 seconds. And they have shown time and time again that recall abilities are improved dramatically after doing this type of exercise. So this is a great way to uh, work out the front part of your brain. It's also a great way to get the parts, of the two parts of your brain or the two hemispheres of your brain to synchronize more effectively. So just a great tool right there, backed by the research, uh, a nice little gem you can take with you and, and incorporate into your life. But again, if you have any balance problems, you need to get those checked out first because moving your eyes fast like that can confuse your balance system and it can allow you to uh, possibly fall if you do have enough of a challenge. So I want you all to be safe doing this type of thing. Number two, number two is the picnic game. Uh, some people have heard of this. Uh, very simply, you want to do this, you can do this by yourself, but it's more effective with two or more people up to a certain point, you know, maybe five or so maximum. Uh, but it's good between two people or three people. I do this with my kids all the time. What you want to do is simply start by saying, I'm going on a picnic and I'm bringing, and then you would start with the letter A. So I would say, I'm going on a picnic and I'm bringing an apple. Okay. It doesn't have to be food just because you're going on a picnic. It doesn't have to be food. So the next person would say, I'm going on a picnic and I'm bringing an apple and a bicycle. So now we have A and B. And the third person or whoever's next would say, I'm going on a picnic. I'm bringing an apple, a bicycle, and a cat. So the more you can get things in different categories, the more difficult it becomes. Now, if you said apple, banana, carrot, that kind of thing, it's easier because they're all in the same category. So depending on how good your memory is, you can make it easier or harder. But it's a great game, and this works <clears throat> working memory in your brain. So being able to hold bits of information while you attend to something else, this is uh, perfect for people that have difficulty when they go in a room and they forgot what they went in for, or they can't remember where they put their keys or things like that. Uh, also for recall of phone numbers and names and things like that. So the picnic game is a great game. Um, if you didn't get that, just go back and listen to it. But you just simply add A, B, C, D, and you have to say them all out each time you do it, and hopefully you'll get to, to Z at some point. Just a great way to work out that working memory. So what that does now is that brings us to the end of our content here. And you know, there is so much more, and, and I hope I didn't talk too fast for you. That's the New York side of me. I've been in the, in the South for 10 years, but the New York side of me comes out every so often, especially when I'm teaching. Uh, but the beauty is you can come back and watch this again and again. You'll see uh, you know, we have students that have taken our classes uh, you know, multiple times simply because there's so much information to be had. And you can miss something simply because there is so much information but we have to cover it at a pretty rapid pace at times. 
So I'm really glad everyone stuck with me for this webinar and, and hope you all have at least one great thing you can put into action right away between these exercises or you know the, the sugar tips, things like that. There's so much to cover and you know that's why I've designed a six-week webinar series that will go into much greater depth on the basics of these topics and more. And I say the basics because six weeks will allow us to really get into blood sugar in the brain and exercise and brain function and uh, topics like neuroplasticity, really understanding some foundational educational requirements and then giving you actionable steps you can put into your daily routine. So these things will all help with building a better brain. That's really what most of us are looking to do. And in the courses I teach, that's what everybody wants is just simply a, <clears throat> a better functioning brain. So this class will be starting on Tuesday, June 21st, and we'll meet for six weeks. Now I've designed the class to be delivered via webinar and the recordings and transcripts of those classes will be available along with some other great handouts and worksheets in a membership only area part of our site that will be associated with this webinar series. So that way, if you're unable to make one or several of the sessions, you can watch the recording later in the free membership access area. Now, this is a luxury many of my classroom students don't have. That said, the, the past few years I've taught a course uh, through the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at the University of North Carolina here in Asheville on the same topic and similar topics. And uh, every semester this, this class fills to capacity and more and more students have wanted in and some have actually taken the course multiple times, you know, twice, three times. So I want to find a way to offer this information to more people at a reasonable price. I do truly feel so passionate about this material, as you can tell, that I want to be able to get it out to anyone that wants to make the best of their brain in their life, and more importantly, with results that they can achieve. You know, people go through a, a course of mine, and, and I get feedback all the time where people say, you know, this one little tip, whether it was restricting sugar or whether it was journaling before bedtime or whether it was the picnic game, had a massive impact on their life and they were able to do things that they couldn't do previously. You combine a lot of these things over time and the brain simply works much, much better. So in summary, we have a six week training program, about an hour long each week. Each week will be broken down into smaller segments so you can go back and go over the, the educational portion or the tips portion. Uh, so you can really start to, to kind of hone in on what you feel is, is most important for you. I have to lay the foundational education, but also to the action steps are what most people are after. So the, the combination of both allows for an understanding that makes the applications more effective. And we'll do this over six weeks so you have a chance to put into practice new material and activities each week so you won't be overloaded. That's a pretty cool thing because people try to do too much at one time very often and they get frustrated, they feel things aren't working, and then they just kind of move on to the next. So we're gonna do it in a methodical fashion that you can implement things week after week. In summary as well, we have the private membership area, which will be for just course enrollees. You'll be able to access this information, watch training, download handouts and slides, any other information, you know, reading lists, whatever we have available, and you'll have access to that for 12 months. In addition, we have a, a private Facebook group that will be creating uh, based on and, and associated with this particular series that we're offering. So this is really cool because people can get together and connect with other folks that are going through the same program. So this is really uh, just so that we can ask questions of one another and, and see how people are doing implementing their strategies learned in the program. And I will jump in from time to time myself and, and allow for uh, insights and answers to questions that happen in this group. And uh, we also have one significant bonus uh, offered with this particular webinar, and that's question and answer sessions. You know, we find all the time at the end of the courses that I teach, whether it's up at the University of North Carolina here in Asheville or uh, in office types of trainings and community uh, focused events that people always have questions and often a lot of questions with this particular type of topic. So we'll have two live question and answer sessions with myself as the moderator at the middle and the end of the six week program. So there's essentially eight sessions instead of six. <clears throat> These will be recorded as well and accessible in the members only section that I talked about if you can't get to them right away. And finally, this is something that I really feel incredibly strongly about. We have what we call a fast acting bonus and we have a limited number of spots for this final bonus as I still hold down a busy practice in between family and, and uh, also being able to get out and do things that I love. It's, it's, it's difficult to, to do so much, but I want people that are truly interested in, in wanting to make massive change in their brain and body health this opportunity. So the first 20 people that sign up will have the opportunity for a 20-minute private phone consultation with me 
And during this consultation, we'll be able to discuss basically your brain health and memory goals. Now, this is not designed to be a full-on history and diagnosis type of situation because so much goes into assessing a brain uh, examination-wise and diagnostic testing-wise, but this is really to help you lay out your brain health and memory goals. Uh, so if you're eager to start on your own brain health goals, sign up right away as you don't want to miss this uh, chance to obtain this free private consultation. Again, only 20 of these will be allowed simply because that is a uh, a significant amount of time that I will be attending to these. But again, something I love to do. I always love talking with people that, that want to make massive change in their brain. Now, the best part of all, there's no risk. The six weeks to a better brain course is only $97. So that basically comes to less than 17 per class. And that would be essentially less than the cost of most cable bills and certainly most smartphone plans that you spend for uh, spend on each month. And this will absolutely have an impact on your life. This can change people's lives significantly in many, many instances. And we're also offering a 60-day money-back guarantee. So if after 60 days you don't find just one thing that is helpful and you want your money back, just call us and we'll do that for you. We'll refund that $97. So based on some of our live events and what we've done in the past, the price for these types of programs run about $299. But since we're able to do it online, it keeps our costs down a bit and we can offer it for $97. So that's a total savings of 202 plus all of the other perks with the private membership, the live question and answer sessions, the Facebook group, the 20 minute consultations for those that get in right away and and possibly some other things that we'll add in as we go along. Uh, but in the past we've done, when we've done seminars, everyone, the bottom line at the end always asks for more information and they're looking for the next step. So that's why we're offering this program and programs that will build on it in the future um, as lifelong learning opportunities because that's what it's all about. We need to continue learning to be effective in making change in our lives and life and the lives in, uh, of those around us. So what you want to do is you want to click on the link in the chat section, chat section of this webinar and that'll take you to the page to get signed up. I'll keep this webinar going for about another five minutes or so once I'm done speaking. And if Mia has any housekeeping items, um, basically everybody will have the opportunity to get signed up through that link. You can also open a browser and go right to the link that I put on the screen here, which is memory.apexbraincenters.com backslash six weeks dash registration. It's right there on the screen. You'll have it with this recorded seminar. It will be emailed to you as well in, a, uh, in an archived copy. So at this point, if anyone has any trouble signing up or questions, you want to send those to Mia. I can answer any clinical-based questions while you got me on the air here. And I want to thank you all so much for your time and interest in my favorite topic. And I look forward to continue learning with you as time goes on. And I'm going to go ahead and just bring Mia back on for a moment, see if she has any questions or housekeeping details at this point. All right, can you hear me, Michael? Yes, I can. All right, we did have one question, and that is, can I expect to see any immediate results from doing some of the things you talked about today, and what about after the six-week course? Well, absolutely, after the six-week course. Uh, when we're looking at um, you know immediate results, somebody simply cutting their blood, uh, their added sugar intake down to 25 grams or less per day, when most people are taking in well over 100 or 200 or more, uh, that will have a profound impact on brain function, and usually it comes in the way of uh, improved clarity and focus of thought, decreased fatigue, uh, things like that, maybe even better sleep. So uh, just after what we talked about today, sure, but certainly after we get into six weeks worth of education on the foundational educational materials people need to understand to handle blood sugar better, to exercise better, to uh, you know, to uh, manage stress more efficiently. Those are, those are where we really hear some of the life changing uh, kind of instant uh, instant feedback things that we get from people, and that could be again improved sleep, decreased stress, decreased anxieties, uh, better family relations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and memory obviously being the the number one thing we're talking about. Okay. I think that's all the questions we had. If anybody else has any other questions, you can just go ahead and submit those to webinars at apexbraincenters.com. If you have any questions about the program or signing up, you can also submit those over there as well. We thank you for being with us today. Great. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, everybody.